Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the launch of the FAIR Office Austria. My name is Teresa Kalova, and I'm a project manager in the FAIR Data Austria project at the Vienna University Library. I'm also part of the team of the FAIR Office. Joining me today are Sarah Striek, Alex Gruber, and Elire Hassani Mavrici, who will be keeping an eye on the chat and answering your questions throughout today's event. I'm excited to have you all here to talk about international development around FAIR data and services, as well as the official launch of the FAIR Office Austria. Before we begin, I want to quickly go through a um, few housekeeping rules. Please stay muted throughout the event. You can post any questions or engage with our speakers um, in the chat box and they will be answered uh, during and after the talks. We will be recording today's event and the slides and some of the video recordings will be available to you after, after the event. I will um, stop sharing my screen now. Okay, and I would now like to turn it over to Professor Ronald Meyer, the Vice Rector for Digitization and Knowledge Transfer at the University of Vienna, as well as a big supporter of FAIR, to welcome you all. Professor Meyer, bitte. Thank you very much, Teresa. Can you hear me all? Okay, wonderfully. I was asked to warmly welcome you today uh, to, to, to today's uh, launch event, and that's exactly what I'm doing now, you know, I warmly welcome you to this event. I'm excited that the FAIR Office in Austria initiative emerged from the project uh, FAIR Data Austria, which is one of the 34 projects funded by the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research in its call Digital and Social Transformation. A call actually that was accompanied uh, by the establishment of a number of vice rectorates for digitalization and something typically um, in many Austrian universities, um, which also who also network among each other in the forum digitalization um, and actually promote the projects, the corporations in the projects and beyond the projects with the national and European and international community, of course. Um, the Fair Data Austria project is designed to strengthen knowledge transfer between universities, but also industry and society in general, and supports the sustainable implementation of the European Open Science Cloud. Now there is already a connection in there between FAIR and EOSC, you know, so they two go together very well, very well in, our, in our view. And, you know, we actually have two offices now, which should closely, in my wish, you know, should closely work together, of course. As the project name suggests, FAIR Data Austria, implementation of the FAIR principles is the core topic of this project. It is particularly warranted through the development of next generation repositories for research data, code and other research outputs on the one hand, so infrastructure, and on the other hand with the development of training and support services that go along with these infrastructures, the usage of these infrastructures. One of the work packages in the project foresees the implementation of a FAIR national node desk, as well as the implementation of local FAIR reference points as contact points for researchers at their institution into the broader FAIR community. The result of this endeavor, the FAIR Office Austria, which we're launching today, is a collaborative effort of the three universities, the two technical universities of Graz and Vienna, as well as the University of Vienna. The future integration of further partners is, of course, planned and more than welcome, as well as an even closer connection to the global GoFair organization. I would wish to thank, you know, uh, those people who have actually strongly promoted and enabled uh, the establishment of the FAIR uh, office. First of all, Hanna Perger, Operations Officer from the GoFair International Support and Coordination Office for promoting a dialogue and systematic engagement with committed countries and communities as the one that is represented here today. Stefan Hanslick as representative from the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research, who enabled the highly dynamic project FAIR Data Austria and is also a promoter 
of research data management open science initiatives in Austria. Thank you very much for this. And all the other dedicated speakers, participants, um, and collaborators working in this project, in the um, projects that are that go along with it in the cluster research data management, as well as the other digital and social transformation projects uh, that have got their ties with this initiative that we're launching today. I wish us all an insightful and enjoyable launch event. All the best and hope to meet you in person soon. Thank you very much. And I turn back to Teresa, I guess. Thank you for the lovely opening words, Professor Maya. Today, we have several exciting talks prepared for you. We will hear two presentations on the International GoFair Initiative, as well as talks on the implementation of the European Open Science Cloud in Austria and the role of FAIR in public data centers. After a short break, you will find out more about the mission of the FAIR Office Austria, as well as hear some exciting updates on new technical infrastructures that are being developed to enable FAIR workflows. Joining us today is Hannah Pergel. Hannah's background is in business administration and management. She has been managing operations of the GoFair International Support and Coordination Office since October 2018. In addition to her role with the GoFair International Office, she also coordinates operations of CoData, the Committee on Data of the International Science Council, as of 2019. Today, she will be discussing the vision and the structure of GoFair Global, as well as the implementation networks and the Data Together initiative. I will turn it over to Hannah now. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Hopefully, you can also see my screen at the moment. Yes. So I'm indeed here to uh, briefly introduce the uh, Global Open Fair initiative uh, since its beginning. Uh, and some of the interesting developments in uh, data together, especially recent in the recent years. Uh, so to from the very start, uh, the so fair guiding principles uh, were initiated in 2014 during a Lawrence Center, uh, followed by a public consultation. Uh, then, the, uh, then the guiding principle seminal paper was published in 2016, and uh, up to date uh, there's uh, close to 4,500 citations. So that's five citations per day on average. Uh, that uh, clearly indicates uh, the rapid take up of the FAIR principles. Uh, and uh, by now, FAIR became pretty much uh, of a hype term. Uh, it's being uh, iterated uh, in uh, international open science policies. Uh, you can find it uh, in the draft recommendations uh, on open science from uh, the UNESCO. Uh, national policymakers are uh, are mentioning FAIR uh, heavily in their uh, uh, draft or already approved uh, policies. Uh, uh, funding organizations are starting to require FAIR uh, outputs from uh, the projects. Uh, Something to keep in mind, though, when looking at implementations is that the FAIR principles uh, primarily emphasize machine actionability of the outputs and not only human uh, readability of the outputs in a FAIR manner. So the GoFair initiative uh, was started in 2017 by uh, three countries in Europe, Germany, the Netherlands and France, uh, initially to kickstart uh, EOSC. Uh, as part of the global internet uh, or web, if you wish, of FAIR data uh, and services. Uh, uh, it is uh, based on the FAIR data principles. Uh, some of the original authors are, uh, are engaged in the initiative and in the com uh, GoFAIR community that has been working since 2017 and 2018. Uh, so the initiative is truly bottom up. It's uh, stakeholder driven uh, by the uh, implementation networks uh, and everything is set up in the manner that uh, we try to uh, primarily support and coordinate the implementation networks so that they could concentrate uh, on their contribution to the Internet of Fair Data uh, and Services. 
Now that uh, we are seeing the EOSC uh, Association already established uh, since the uh, end of 2020, uh, the initial GoFair project uh, is uh, actually going to an end. We will be holding uh, an event later this month uh, to report uh, from that part of the pro uh, for, uh, that uh, portion of the initiative and uh, on the important outputs. And, but uh, there's also a transition underway in GoFair where we are looking forward uh, how to uh, best uh, continue supporting the GoFair community in uh, the implementation networks and diverse uh, and how to continuously uh, engage with the developments. So the primary uh, vehicle for the GoFair uh, initiative are implementation networks. You will uh, later on hear from Peter Cracker, who's uh, going to talk about a practical example of an implementation network. Uh, in general, the GoFair ins are open to uh, everyone, so it's very light, lightweight uh, participation. So whether you're an individual institution or a project, you can either join an existing in or suggest forming an implementation network. Uh, I already mentioned that the primary objective of INS is to uh, define and create uh, components of the Internet uh, of Fair Data and Services. Uh, I listed here the rules of engagement, but there's a link to uh, the full document on the GoFair website, which you can consult later on, uh, since I will be making my slides available. Uh, just to have an idea about the size of the community, so by early 2019, we had uh, uh, over 30 implementation networks, so that was far more than we expected when GoFair was uh, starting. Uh, and uh, should you be interested to explore which uh, ins are currently active uh, and operating under GoFair, you can uh, uh, you can check the link that I included in the slides uh, to the GoFair website. Should you be interested to join uh, an in, and then you can uh, easily either contact the in coordinators directly through the web page, or you can contact the GoFair International Support and Coordination Office. Uh, at the moment. In here, I'm uh, listing also some of the more recent developments within the GoFair implementation networks community. Uh, I want to mention that uh, as of 2020, uh, rather than growing the number of ends, uh, the community is concentrating on convergence around existing uh, solutions of fair implementations. Uh, as one of one as one of those results, uh, there were there was a digital intelligence special issue published in 2020, where you can uh, read about uh, first uh, about fair principles, fair first uh, implementation choices. Uh, many of the authors of uh, the original uh, fair principles paper uh, were engaged uh, in in. Uh, drafting some of the uh, some of the papers included in the special issue uh, and as well as the GoFair implementation networks community. You can also explore uh, the verification framework uh, designed by the GoFair community, uh, which is uh, structured around the metadata for machines workshops, uh, then feeding into a fair implementation profile showing uh, the choices made by the various uh, communities of practice uh, and therefore allowing to explore uh, which of the uh, choices may be overlapping in the uh, co in the communities and therefore driving convergence. Ultimately, the outputs uh, from uh, the data uh, of the communities of uh, practice uh, can be feeding into the fair data points uh, that would be uh, located uh, globally. As for GoFair governance, uh, uh, I'm listing here the existing uh, GoFair governance, uh, which is driven by the needs of the GoFair community uh, and also by the uh, founding member states. Uh, now that we are in transition, uh, it is foreseen that the governance will change and uh, to allow for global participation of other uh, 
states and offices or fair representation offices, if you wish, uh, such as uh, the Austrian office, for instance. There's actually a discussion tomorrow about a way to support the GoFair community going forward and uh, uh, the second phase of GoFair. Uh, something to mention, though, is that Peter Kracker, who will be presenting next, is also a member of the GoFair executive board, uh, which is representing the uh, general uh, GoFair community. So, so it's a subset of the stakeholder forum members, basically. In here, you can, uh, I included a link to the Fair Festival 2021, uh, where you will learn also more about the future of GoFair, uh, as well as the outputs of the first phase of the initiative and of the project. Uh, so uh, unless already registered, I encourage you to uh, join us uh, later on in June. Uh, the event is organized by my colleagues in uh, ZBW uh, in Germany. With that, I would like to move on to broader developments in the uh, global research data ecosystem. So, uh, four major international data organizations have been uh, holding quite a number of discussions since uh, 2019, actually, exploring uh, ways of collaboration and uh, also overlaps uh, in their operations uh, in uh, uh, in the communities that they support, uh, in the uh, key activities that they wish to run. Uh, therefore, a statement has been published uh, in March 2020 outlining their commitment to cooperate uh, and uh, align their activities uh, where possible, while still st keeping the, uh, the independence of the support organizations uh, who would be primarily operating uh, in their uh, distinct uh, uh, areas of expertise and in the manner that is uh, slightly different, but definitely uh, complementary. Uh, since 2020, there are regular meetings uh, and discussions of the Data Together organization's leadership as well as secretariats uh, uh, where we uh, aim to identify the uh, key areas of uh, operations interesting uh, to uh, either a subset of these four organizations uh, or to all, all four. Uh, this, uh, uh, so this image shows uh, the overall uh, overview of the areas of expertise. But to simplify that, uh, should we look from the uh, top uh, left uh, quadrant, the code data is uh, concentrating primarily, uh, primarily on uh, uh, policies and recommendations. It is a long-standing organization under the International Science Council uh, running uh, its operations since 1966. Uh, GoFair is uh, much newer, established in 2017, and it is truly bottom up, uh, primarily concentrating on the fair principles implementation specifics, uh, sort of a test bed uh, and pr practical uh, le learning fair by uh, learning fair by doing. Uh, RDA would be uh, is also a bottom up. Uh, initiative uh, much larger and uh, is concentrating on uh, uh, cracking intellectual uh, nuts and uh, making recommendations and suggestions. Part of those uh, may be then uh, taken up uh, even by GoFair implementation networks. And uh, the world data systems is the connection to the repositories world. Uh, the key topics and activities that are or have been uh, driven by the four organizations so far is uh, collaboration on the CoData Decadal program, uh, activities uh, with the aim to foster global cooperation of uh, open science platforms, uh, data together uh, activities around COVID-19, uh, which were uh, started uh, last year, uh, also activities in relation to SDGs are being explored uh, and uh, three of the members of Data Together are running uh, International Data Week conferences every other year. 
And I believe that is uh, my last slide. So with that, uh, I thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. I'm sure that uh, other speakers will uh, address some of the aspects uh, in here in more detail and on the national level. And should you have questions, I'm happy to answer those now in chat or you can uh, at any point reach out to me via email or you can find my contact details uh, also on the websites of the two organizations that I'm supporting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. That was uh, most illuminating. Uh, if you have any questions for Hannah, please do write them in the chat uh, where she can answer them while I uh, let me move on to our next speaker. Um, Peter Kaka is the founder and chairman of Open and Knowledge Maps, a charitable nonprofit dedicated to dramatically increasing the visibility of scientific knowledge for science and society alike. Peter is a member of the GoFair executive board as well as a coordinator of the GoFair Implementation Network on Discovery and a core team member of the Open Science Network Austria, the OANA. Prior to founding the Open Knowledge Maps, Peta was a senior researcher at the No Center F of the Graz University of Technology, managing the topic of open science. Today, Peta will give you more information on the GoFair Implementation Network on Discovery. Thank you for joining us and please go ahead, Peta. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction um, and uh, the opportunity to speak today. I would like to congratulate the project team and everyone involved on the launch of the Fair Office Austria, which is a great initiative. I myself have been involved with GoFair since 2018. And in 2019, we launched the Discovery Implementation Network. And uh, together with Hannah's um, great presentation, I hope to give you a further insight as to how GoFair actually works in practice. I'm going to share my screen now so you can see the presentation. Yes, so I hope it's visible now. I see a nod. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to start off with the motivation for our work because um, as many other things, uh, oops, um, as many other things, um, it starts with the researcher. In this case, it's a researcher who wants to find and reuse in data of their interest. And uh, of course, that leads to uh, an impulse to search. But then a second question pops up. Where do I actually start? What is my entry point for data discovery? Because as you can see, there are many different options. You can start in the literature and then move from there to the data. You can do a cross-domain dataset search if that's useful in your discipline, or you can use a domain-specific search. And many of these things are overlapping, but they're not necessarily interlinked. And so data discovery is actually a complex ecosystem and uh, people are, and researchers are exposed to a lot of entry points, a lot of challenges along the way. And of course, um, that can lead to success. So to find the data, that they were looking for, but more often than not, it actually leads to a case of I find data, but it's actually not uh, related to what I was looking for, or it does not uh, run exactly along the specifications that I was looking for, and also no data, right? At the dead end, I haven't found anything at all. And an indication that it's actually the latter two things is that we found that up to 85% data, uh, of data sets are never re reused. And that, of course, means that we cannot cache many of the checks that we've written as their open and fair data movement. And so discoverability is a key challenge when it comes to data. And um, I think we really need to make big improvements there in order to really reap the benefits of this open science system that we're building at the moment. Right now, there's a lack of adequate user, user interfaces for data discovery. There's often a simple reuse of existing interface concepts that we already know from publications, but that often cannot be translated to data sets or not readily be translated to data sets. And there's often a design from the systems rather than the user's perspective. So we are often looking at what is missing actually in the system rather than understanding what the users actually want. 
And unfortunately, we also see new market entrants that follow a closed and proprietary model. And that is, of course, not compatible with the Internet of Fair Data and Services that we're uh, wanting to build. And it creates new paywalls and prevents innovation. And this was the starting point for the Discovery Implementation Network. So as I said earlier, we started in 2019 and since then we've actually grown uh, considerably. So now we're 28 organizations. Um, I'm the chair for Open Knowledge Maps. And since this year, I also have two co-chairs, uh, Brigitte Matja from Thesis and Alessia Bardi from OpenAI. We also have for um, personal members, so in GoFair, you can either join as a representative of your organization or simply as an interested researcher, as an interested individual. Our purpose is to provide user faces and other uh, user interfaces and other user facing services for data discovery across disciplines. Uh, we want to explore new and innovative ways of enabling discovery, so such as visualizations, recommender systems, se semantics, content mining, annotation, and responsible metrics. So many of the things that we see in other areas of scholarly communication, but we not see in data search at the moment. And we want to apply user involvement and participatory design, so really coming from the user's perspective. And we want to expand our horizon beyond just academia. Our objectives are to improve the visibility and discoverability of research data across disciplines, to increase the reuse of their data and therefore also the efficiency and the effectiveness of research, and to provide open and fair alternatives to the closed and proprietary infrastructures that we are seeing coming up today. Our work plan is threefold. Um, the first is the stock taking, stock taking of the relevant use cases, the indices, interfaces and services out there, a structuring of what we found into an open ecosystem for discovery that fulfills the use cases, and finally the implementation of this ecosystem. And in the first two years, we've been uh, focusing especially on the first two parts and I want to introduce now two key areas, two key results that we've achieved in the implementation network. And the first one relates to the use cases. So we did a large scale use case collection um, and use cases in the form uh, of as a role, I want to go so that benefit. So as a researcher, I want to get an overview of data sets in my field so that I can determine which data I can reuse. And we have collected over 100 such use cases um, from our own input, from workshops, from studies, from interviews. And we've also collaborated with the RDA interest group on data discovery. Um, so I think that already shows the links that Hannah already uh, introduced in the beginning. And that is actually through paired members between the different groups. Um, and this is also how the knowledge exchange is done at the moment. Yeah, and then we've performed an elaborate analysis and an annotation of entities, thematic clustering, and also an initial community prioritization. And a uh, bird's eye view of the results can be seen in this graphic. So on the left hand side, you can see um, the different clusters that we found. So for example, metadata for discovery, which has the largest number of use cases attached to it, and also data citation, overview, and linking. Then you can also see the actors that um, have contributed these use cases or meta metadata unsurprisingly was dominated by researchers but data citation already becomes very interesting for students and then when we come to the overview of data sets uh, really a lot of different actors are interested in use cases around that or they have use cases around that. In summary um, we found that most of the use cases described um, the current infrastructure provides for or it doesn't provide for, or it provides for it badly. For example, as a researcher, I want to find data sets that are similar to those that I've already used. So a classic recommender use case in data search, this is still um, not uh, possible across disciplines. So this reveals crucial requirements for the data discovery infrastructure, and we will soon uh, publish an open data set with all the use cases um, with an accompanying data. The second area that I want to introduce is our work on infrastructure. 
Uh, this can speak back also to the first uh, slide that I showed is that we have many, many different actors in this system from aggregators, publishers, research organizations to uh, repositories, registries and value added services. And so we want to understand this um, ecosystem better. And for that, we do an analysis, a categorization. We want to identify gaps and then also suggest guidelines for the implementation. And uh, this is a work that's very much in progress, but this is an early result. So this shows you the flow between data producers and data consumers and the many, many different entities that are in between. And what we, what we actually want to find out is what does it need um, within the system so that we can actually uh, fulfill the use cases that we found, especially the ones that were highly prioritized. And so our next steps is to finish the structuring and then work towards an implementation. I should say that we'll not, we don't want to provide uh, completely new interfaces. Uh, you may know the joke that if you want to uh, summarize 14 standards, um, well, at the end, you have a 15th standard, right? So and I think that, in a sense, also applies to interfaces. We really want to provide or improve the existing user interfaces, especially the ones, of course, that are within the implementation network, the infrastructures that we already have on board, provide new links, provide new functionality, and see how we can easily kind of um, guide the users from system to system. Yeah, um, if that has um, sparked an interest, um, here is how you can actually get involved in GoFair. Uh, so you can join an interest uh, an existing implementation network. I would uh, suggest you go to the website and uh, look at different uh, implementation works uh, networks that have already taken up their work. There are many that are domain specific. So if you want to improve the situation in a, uh, in an existing domain. Um, there is likely already an implementation network there, um, but there are also cross-domain networks. And of course, GoFair is always open to new implementation networks. And uh, so you can start your own implementation network. And that's actually much easier than you might expect. You, um, of course, have to find your collaborators and register your interest with GoFair. And then GoFair will get in touch with you and help you to prepare a manifesto, which is a brief high level description in two pages. And then essentially you submit your manifesto and as soon as it is, it is approved, you can get started. And to get maybe more of a taste, a taste of what the implementation networks are doing, I would really um, invite you to join us for the FAIR Festival uh, from 21st to 23rd. Of June. Yeah, um, from my personal experience, um, GoFair really um, started where I personally, or we as a small organization, had to stop. Where we were always very passionate about, not about research data discovery, but there, there are limits as to what you can do as an individual and as a single organization. And since we do have the implementation network, it really um, spurred the growth, it spurred the collaboration, it brought the people together and it's become a very productive way of thinking about this area and hopefully improving it as we're going forward. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have in the chat. Thank you for the great talk, Peter. I'm excited to find out more, especially about the use cases you mentioned. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that uh, many people will get in touch with you regarding the uh, implementation networks because we have very many uh, people who have joined us today that are uh, uh, huge uh, supporters of FAIR and want to see it happen. Okay, so if you have any questions for Peter, please do um, pop them in the chat while I will introduce our next speakers, Stefan Hanslik and Paolo Butoni. Stefan Hanslik is uh, the head of the Technical Science Unit at the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research. Stefan holds a PhD in biology and genetics. He represents Austria in numerous international organizations and initiatives. He is the Austrian delegate in the Horizon 2020 Program Committee Research Infrastructures, the governing board of the Joint Initiative of the European High Performance Computing and the Infrastructure Reflection Group. He's also the Austrian delegate of the EOSC steering board. Paolo Budroni holds a PhD in philosophy, art history, and romance philology. 
as well as degrees in foreign trade and European integration. His long-term involvement in digital asset management, as well as research support services, have provided him with a thorough knowledge of technical systems and the requirements of the academic world. He has experience not only regarding research data, but also open educational resources and cultural heritage. 2002 through 2004, he was a professor for marketing at the graduate level at the University of Perugia in Italy. Together, they will discuss the topic of FAIR in the European Open Science Cloud and give you information on the implementation of the EOSC in Austria. Stefan, Paolo, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks a million uh, for introduction. I share my screen now. I hope you can see it in a second. Yeah, here we go. Yes, there we go. Um, First of all, uh, let me let me say um, thank you and give uh, congratulations to, to the whole group. I've seen a lot of uh, faces, of very important faces here on the screen, which all uh, belong to these uh, developments and the achievements of, of uh, the, the Fair Office Austria. Um, I think it's a, it's a very important day for all of us. And I try to sum, um, sum up some developments here and also want to say sorry for those who maybe have seen one or the other slide uh, previously in, in one of my talks. But I will put uh, a focus on fair data as a guide, as a guiding pr principle in all these developments. Uh, also, I want to say sorry to, to Paolo that I didn't put his name on these slides, but I will do uh, afterwards. So uh, let's start. Uh, as usual, I, I want to start with a uh, definition of EOSC. Um, because I think it's rather important just to go back uh, sometimes to the to the definitions uh, on EOSC, and I think that uh, the publication um, jointly made by Paolo and uh, Jean-Claude Bodiman, as well as uh, Michel Scoop, is the the document where you find the properest uh, definition of EOSC, and it is still valid. And when you read in between the lines, you will immediately find the FAIR principles as the guiding principle um, of uh, the EOSC process. Um, and in former days, we also used to define it as the backbone uh, of EOSC. I will uh, start with a very political statement. But when you uh, look at this political statement uh, made by our EC President Ursula von der Leyen at the uh, World Economic Forum in, in Davos in 2020, that you will immediately uh, see that she was talking, or okay, here you have the link uh, between, you can, can listen to this talk again, uh, you will realize that she uh, more or less also defined um, fair data as the guiding principles for EOSC. Um, because when it, whenever it came uh, to data, um, there was the findability, the accessibility, the interoperability, as well as the reusable um, manner of data was always uh, a, a big uh, subject. And this means that uh, fair data is not only that it is not the, the only idea of stakeholders, it became uh, an idea or a concept for a very high political range. Um, back to the vision uh, of EOSC. Um, when you uh, read about the, the, the main pillars of the, of the EOSC process and the EOSC idea, uh, you also immediately find um, a very, uh, very uh, straight uh, statement here that um, EOSC is developing a web of fair data, as mentioned before, and services. Um, including uh, publications and software, meaning that what I said before, the FAIR principles are the guiding principles for the whole process. So we won't end up with a very functional core of, of EOSC, I come to this later, without the FAIR principles. Uh, and this also means how important all the efforts and the hard work of uh, various FAIR groups in Europe and in the world um, are and I see as a, as, a, as a prerequisite for all the work 
which will be done in the future for uh, the Austrian, uh, the Austrian uh, Fair Office. So when we are talking about this web of scientific insight, of course, we are talking about the web of fair data and related services. Of course, we are talking about the federation of existing and future um, data resources. We are talking about virtual places where science, um, science producers, research performing organizations uh, and consumers come together. We are talking about an open ended range uh, of content and services. Uh, we are meeting all European data requirements, also meaning we have to um, meet all legal, legal requirements. Uh, but I think one of our speakers today will come to much more details about the legal constraints in Europe. And there is um, an interaction with other regions of the world as we have seen uh, before. So the overreaching principles uh, for Dialogue in the EOS is uh, that researchers uh, or research has to be the center of the EOS initiatives. Uh, it is a multi-stakeholder rhythm uh, that is part of it. There is the openness, uh, there is the FAIR principles as stated uh, many times before, and there is the Federation of Infrastructures as well as the machine actionable and the machine learning tools we need um, to give support to the researchers in Europe. Um, I'll go back now in the in the US history and uh, what is important uh, when mentioning that um, is that we had um, some very important or rather important uh, phases in the implementation of the EOS. And one was, to my opinion, uh, the launch uh, we had um, in the year 2000, 2018 and the phase between 18 and 2020, because here we are talking about uh, all the efforts that were taken uh, for the for the years um, within the, the uh, Horizon 2020 program um, with an artificial um, border uh, to the next program the Horizon Europe. That mean, means uh, that EOSC uh, had a governance, a governance structure with the start uh, in 2018 um, after the launch, launch event. And within this uh, governing structure, we had on one hand, of course, the stakeholder forum, the stakeholder group, which played a lot, uh, which had a lot of work to do also before it came to the, to the political idea uh, of EOSC and the governance board, as well as the representatives of the European Commission. But within the stakeholder forum or the governance board, uh, there were working groups built up within these two years. And you could imagine that fair data and fair data implementation was on top in these working groups. So there were a lot of achievements also in connection to, for example, EOSC Pillar, the EOSC Secretariat and many other uh, projects which focused on fair data implementation. Um, if you want to read uh, something about the, 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 the developments till the end of 2020, I also recommend uh, an article uh, made by Paolo, me and uh, Barbara, um, which summed up most of the, of the um, implementations which could be achieved uh, within this time. And it's, uh, I think, quite interesting to see how fast the developments also uh, went on. So uh, I mean, already mentioned projects uh, supporting uh, EOSC. Um, again, EOSC Secretariat was a very strong uh, pusher in implementing the EOSC idea and make it become reality as well as e-infrastructure central and uh, to a certain extent also EOS Cup. Uh, but there were many and uh, you can imagine in each of these um, projects for itself, there was the common sense of EOSC, of implementation of the EOSC, but there also was a common sense on fair implementation. Uh, to come back to the to the process of uh, the, the funding tools, uh, the European funding tools, and the organization of those. So what had ha what has happened after after the break in the end of 2020? We still have a governance structure in a kind of three-part head, 
but this 2E part had uh, developed very well and is now um, more concise, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of that we still have the European Commission as body, we still have the member states and the associated countries uh, summed up in the, in the steering board, and the stakeholders uh, were assembled or organized uh, now in the so called EOSC Association. Um, so the EOSC Association, as the European board for the, for the European um, stakeholders responsible for, for the implementation of EOSC, they uh, will have a, a contractual agreement, an MOU, which will be a uh, site between the EOSC Association and the Commission. Uh, the Commission and the EOSC Association will establish a so-called partnership board. Uh, there will also be one representative from the, from the member states, from the steering board members. And um, this tripartite will carry on, which means that there will be a lot of sustainable funding uh, possibilities for the implementation, which I guess is a rather important sign. Uh, together also uh, with some other uh, possibilities which come out from the program research infrastructures. So there will be the co-programmed partnership for itself and uh, funding schemes from other programs as well. So the association was um, implemented in December 2020. Um, there was the following, there were four uh, founding members with CISA, Géant, GAR and CSSC. I won't go into the details. There was uh, an incorporation in, in 29th of July 2020. Uh, they obtained a royal uh, degree on Friday the 11th uh, of September 2020. And so the assembly went on. The first general assembly took place 17th and, uh, of December 2020. So you see there was, was a lot of speed in the developments of this association as the stakeholder group uh, in Europe. And uh, luckily also with the participation of Austrian uh, institutions. And, um, but I'll come to this later on. Um, when, we, when we have a look at this uh, structure, we now have this three-parted on the European level. We also have to keep in mind that there are a lot of uh, regional, regional efforts um, when it comes to the implementation of the EASC. Uh, these regional uh, efforts, of course, are corresponding to everything which is done in the European level. So there were um, thoughts about how could this be organized, um, that the, 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 the Austrian community, so to say, uh, have the possibility to participate uh, in the partnership, the programs, and the process in the whole. So, um, we had the opportunity to mandate a so called mandated organization to the association uh, of, the, of the partnership. And this was done by the ministry uh, because this was uh, part of the uh, terms of reference. And we long thought about the Austrian mandated organization, but finally ended up with uh, the ACONET um, ENRIN, the Austrian ENRIN, as the optimized legal entity uh, to enter the association. But uh, the legal entity alone is not um, the, 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 the instrument uh, to enter the EOSC. So therefore, we, um, we tried also to find um, an operative group, which is then doing all the work for the mandated organization. Uh, so um, knowing that the legal uh, entity is, is, is Aconet, there was a group established uh, which belongs um, of, the, of the members, the observers to the uh, association, as well as um, to non-members and or non-partners in the association because we always have to take into account that under the umbrella of the mandated organization we have many many uh, institutions groups um, universities which are interested in the process which want to take part but at the moment are no active members 
So therefore, I come back to the main structure. We have the tripartite of the EASC steering board where the member states are sitting in, represented by myself and my colleague from the BMK. We have the EASC association as an ESBL, um, as the stakeholder forum in Europe and the EC. So we mandated an organization. We have a support office, which is currently in the process of um, um, of um, its organization. And we, from, from this day now, we have another structure, which is of utmost importance is the Fair Office Austria. Uh, because whenever stakeholders come into place, we are talking about data, we are talking about data exchange and all these things. So the role of Fair Data Office is rather important and will uh, be an in integrative um, group. Again, to the stakeholders, where I see the Fair Office Austria is, of course, in the in the uh, in, in the members of the ESPL of the association, where the observers are, the Austrian observers are, and where those members of the Austrian mandated organizations are, which are currently not members or observers, because these are the Austrian stakeholders, and they all um, tend um, to make their data fair at the moment. Again, I don't want to confuse you too much. Uh, we have the three part head and the, on the level of the interaction between all these groups, between observers, members, the support of EOSC support office, the Fair Office Austria, we have very uh, straightforward, easy ways to communicate either with the EC, with the steering board, with the association uh, to finally implement the EOSC. Uh, and therefore, I see here also a rather important role of Fair Office Austria next to the one of the EOSC support office uh, to make all this possible. If I I'm uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, we need to move to the next talk now. Could okay, so I just I could just skip what it was. Could you please sum up your next points, uh, your last points in one sentence for us? Um, maybe I just uh, want to mention in the last sentence EOSC Cafe. The ESC Wiki and, and of course, uh, Fair Office Austria as working instruments for all the stakeholders. We have these instruments and we should carry on. And please do not forget that everything, and here I come to the end, but it was mentioned before, all these activities are connected to international um, uh, processes as well. As you see, uh, it's very similar to my uh, previous speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Paolo, for the exciting updates. We are uh, definitely uh, going to be. Uh, everyone should be watching uh, what's going to happen with the EOS mandated organization that's uh, starting uh, their activities now. Uh, you can engage uh, in a discussion with Stefan and with Paolo in uh, the chat. Uh, while I introduce the last speaker of the first part of uh, today's event. Uh, Martin Zemberger. Martin is uh, with the Austrian Federal Ministry for Digital and Economic Affairs. He is responsible for the European data policy. He has been the head of the task force on open data and public sector information since 2019. During the Austrian EU presidency in 2018, he was the council chair on the open data directive. As previous member of the single market unit, Martin has long-standing experience on EU internal market affairs and the digital economy. His current activities include the negotiations on the EU Data Governance Act and on defining high-value data sets within the framework of the Open Data Directive. Today, he will focus on fair and public data centers in Austria. Please go ahead, Martin. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Teresa. Yeah, I'm trying to share my screen right now. Just a second. Um, yeah, there we are. So very nice. Hello on my behalf. Uh, it is very exciting to be here today uh, in this historic event of the launch of the Fair Office Austria. Um, I will uh, talk a bit about the data policy developments and in, in the particular um, on the Open Data Directive and the EU Data Governance Act at EU, at EU level. Uh, both acts uh, 
have great implications on national policies, of course, and everything is interconnected as we know. Uh, so what is the starting point uh, in concerning data policy and data management today? We're seeing actually a lacking data availability across many institutions, uh, the emergence of data silos, uh, and, and the actually the lacking uh, possibility to reuse data and the lacking technical interoperability. All these problems actually contribute great to, to uh, data not being available for research uh, and, and actually uh, not for the public benefit. Thus, we're talking much about outdated cultures, about outdated business models and the lacking capacity for data analysis and data literacy. And this is actually something we want to go further. We need to address and therefore uh, it is very much uh, essential to have a fair uh, office Austria uh, that could also contribute to tackling these problems. So actually we're seeing this in times of the pandemic that actually uh, uh, maybe we have been used to living in a closed world, but I think that's not the new normal we should uh, we should follow. So uh, I hope we can we can follow the open uh, approach, and this is also true for the data uh, for the data sphere and data policy in general. Thus, we need to get away from a data lock-in to creating value for the public good. Thus, because data gives us the power to to uh, tackling these, these grand challenges, to tackling imbalances, poverty, diseases, the pandemics as we have seen. And I think we should always be aware that uh, there is great purpose in, in having more data and having data better reusable. Uh, so what is the role of the government? And I'm speaking as, a, as an official of the Federal Ministry for Digital Affairs. The government also at the European level is uh, being regarded as having a pioneering role. This, the public sector um, has a tremendous uh, volume of data uh, that could be used for economic and social development. So it is the mission also of the public sector to go ahead uh, and to make this data available. And uh, above all, I'm thinking a lot about research and uh, we see this uh, these day, days that actually we need to make data, uh, more data available for research. Um, globally seen, the international standard is open government. Um, one could say that Austria is still not yet ready uh, for fully implementing this principle, but I think we're, we're, we're endeavoring to, to getting ever nearer to this goal and to, to, to say, uh, <laughs> to, to, in the end, to have an open government uh, with regard to, to any data uh, the public sector produces. Uh, we also have to bear in mind that uh, many of the activities of the public sectors are actually publicly financed, and therefore the goal should be to make data uh, publicly available. One interesting um, piece, uh, interesting fact is actually the uh, the data governance structure within the organizations and, and ministries and therefore uh, it is very much welcomed to have uh, data officers or as you're trying to develop maybe data, data stewards who are pushing forward with the fair data principles and the, the better data usability. So the data policy in Europe and within the member states is grounded on one very particular directive. It's the open data directive that sets the horizontal legal base for the reuse of any kind of public sector data. It is uh, implemented in all member states nationally. Uh, the new directive has to be implemented by July 17. And I think it will set some major uh, new standards with regard to the, the, the reusability of data. Um, just briefly, the directive sets some minimum sets of rules for with regard to the definitions, the formats, chargings, uh, standard licenses are being uh, mentioned, uh, transparency criteria, and of course, uh, it also sets since 2003 onwards uh, very practical uh, arrangements uh, concerning metadata, the findability of data, uh, single access points, just as the national, national data portals, and so on. And newly included is also dynamic data that should be available via application programming interfaces. Um, the extended scope of the new um, version of the Open Data Directive um, is introducing an extended scope also to research data. And uh, so, let me delve into this a little bit. So the directive explicitly states to the member states that uh, member states should shall support the availability of research data by adopting national policies, uh, aiming at making publicly funded research data openly available. Thus, uh, it is very important to bear in mind uh, the open access principle that needs to be implemented by all member states. And the directive generally uh, specifies also the uh, principle of open by default. 
uh, thus, as mentioned before, the public sector should actually um, follow this principle in general. The concerns uh, concerning uh, intellectual property should be addressed uh, through the principle as open as possible and as close as necessary. And I hope that in particular with regard to the cultural sector and the research sector, that this principle should also be the guiding star that guides all our efforts in this domain. Um, Fair data is, of course, also mentioned in the Open Data Directive, and uh, the directive uh, itself states that data management planning should become a standard scheme, uh, ma thus making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, it is being addressed to all researchers and research performing organizations, and I hope that this uh, extended scope will also give a boost to the research sector that actually, uh, yes, indeed, uh, research data shall not be kept in a silo, it shall be made findable and accessible all across different arenas. Um, the portals you might already know, uh, there is in, e in each member state a national data portal and all the, these national data portals are interconnected with the European data portal. As you can see, it's dataeuropa.eu. Um, just briefly, the uh, directive also introduces a new booster to, date, to the data availability across Europe. Uh, it's, it's the so-called notion of high value data sets. There will be a separate implementing regulation upcoming soon, and this will address some, some flaws in certain sectors as the geospatial sector, the earth, earth observation sector, meteor, meteorological data will be available, more of that. Statistics, of course, we've learned throughout the pandemics that statistical data is very much important and company, company ownership data and mobility data also. We hope to, uh, to boost the availability of, of, of uh, in, in these sectors. Thus, high value data sets above all have to be free of charge, they have to be machine readable, they have to be provided by application programming interfaces and were relevant as a bulk download. Um, that was the domain of open data, but there are also endeavors taking place at European level concerning closed data, concerning protected data, and uh, the European, the EU Data Governance Act introduces some elements uh, whereby actually uh, also protected data can be made reusable. That's, this is the newest effort. We're currently in, in the negotiations uh, on this file. So be prepared that uh, from a certain moment on, there will be secure processing environments installed uh, in each member state. Uh, that should give access to researchers to certain data. Above all, it's statistical data, maybe health data, and social data um, that is of major concern. So uh, member states will be encouraged to introduce these um, secure processing environments. And on the other hand, um, data intermediaries will play a major role in the European data economy. So um, be prepared that um, specified, uh, specialized actors will appear in the European uh, data market that should facilitate also the exchange business to business, business to government, um, among everybody, uh, creating personal data spaces and so on. It will be very fascinating to see. And what is also important for researchers is the possibility for data altruism. And we hope, uh, well, the European Commission and the member states will pursue to make, uh, to make data altruism possible in, in Europe. And this is particularly meant to make data reusable for secondary purposes. Uh, such as research purposes. Um, as a last slide, actually, uh, I just want to um, uh, to 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 uh, give you an insight into into uh, future developments. And one development we have already heard of by Stefan uh, is the European Open Science Cloud that is being developed. Uh, it's, it's very fascinating to see. But there are also many other sectoral data spaces. Um, uh, that we're that we're trying to make happen, uh, thus creating a, a true internal market for data. Uh, there will be at least nine separate uh, European common European data spaces developed in the health arena, in, in, the, in the industrial arena, in the, in the energy and climate field, and so on. Um, and there's also a, an industry-led uh, initiative called Gaia-X, and uh, I think Andreas will talk later on a little bit also about the possibilities of a reuse of closed data. So um, I think the, those are very fascinating times for researchers also. Uh, many data spaces and many possibilities emerging. I would just like to say thank you and congratulate you for the installment, installation of the Fair Office Austria. And uh, let me uh, close my session by saying use the power of data. Yeah.
Thank you. Those are some powerful words, pun intended. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the great talk. And uh, I think it's really uh, fascinating, especially the initiative to enable the reuse of protected data. I'm, I'm sure that will be a great use to researchers um, in Europe and outside. Um, so Martin will be available in the chat to answer any questions you might have. And uh, we will now take a short coffee break. Uh, Teresa, may I yes. just, uh, we are totally in time. Um, and I just wanted to know if uh, Paolo is still here and if he wanted to add something um, to the EOSC support office. Sure. If Paolo is still available and would like mm -hmm. to add something, we would have time to, to, to give five minutes of our break time. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Yes, just a few words uh, because um, <clears throat> Stefan uh, said um, everything uh, what uh, was of relevance. I, ju I just like to add something which is ref uh, ref refers to the fair activities. Um, I believe uh, EOSC is not possible without fair. This has been said several times, also Stefan mentioned it. But um, concerning the Austrian situation, um, it will be our duty to have very close links uh, to the FAIR related activities, the building up of the FAIR office, uh, the support uh, to the FAIR office concerning then its international activities uh, concerning uh, uh, the GoFAIR uh, level. And uh, in a reciprocal in a reciprocal way, uh, the same support uh, in a closed way to the EOS mandated organization. Um, I, I believe you, you know it, uh, you Barbara, you know it, that we are working on this and also the, the colleagues who are now uh, working on setting up the EOS uh, mandated organization, the support office, but all others should know that uh, the working groups of the uh, Austrian mandated organization are uh, um, mixed uh, groups uh, where the fair uh, relevant activities are conveyed uh, with the same effort as we do it for the EOS mandated organization. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, Right, so we can now uh, take our short break and uh, I will see you all at uh, in seven minutes. <laughs> Back everyone. Right, so um, we will uh, go ahead with the second part of our program now. For uh, those of you who don't know her, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Barbara Sanchez Solis. Uh, Barbara is the head of the Center for Research Data Management at TU Wien. The center is currently dedicated to implementing repository infrastructures as well as automated DMP services. Barbara is involved in the ministry funded project Fair Data Austria and particularly interested with setting up the Fair Office. Of she is involved in several Horizon 2020 projects, including the EOSC building projects. Today, Barbara will give a talk on the mission and the goals of the Fair Office Austria. Please go ahead, Barbara. Thank you, Teresa. I will share my screen. So I hope you can see the presenter's perspective now. Okay. So um, me and many of my colleagues who are active in research data management consulting have explained in the last year to the researchers what the FAIR principles mean. FAIR has suddenly appeared in the funders guidelines and in DMP templates. And so especially in the beginning, this FAIR concept was a bit shaped by the perspective of the funders. We also repeated FAIR on a very superficial level. We explained to the researchers it's about making data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. 
at the same time, we felt we stay a bit on the superficial level with this explanation. Just two weeks ago, I heard a presentation by Peter Wittenberg, and he also spoke about a fairness paradox, claiming that almost all researchers by now have heard about FAIR and they also support the idea. But on the other hand, in daily practices, um, there is still not a lot of advance. And this is an observation we also um, make when we do consulting. So with our endeavor to implement a FAIR Office Austria here, in Austria here on a national basis, we would like to dive a bit deeper into the concept and we would like to really, really deal with each um, separate principle. At the moment, we have a very dynamic situation in Austria, thanks to a number of projects that deal around uh, digitalization processes at universities. Many universities have resources at the moment to implement infrastructures and tools. For example, a number of universities are in the process of implementing data repositories or machine actionable data management tools, but also services for data analysis. And a lot of effort also goes into support and training. However, if we want our researchers to really integrate FAIR into their practices, and if we want them to really exploit all the potential of the new technologies, we have to pay attention to make these services as fair as possible. We also talk about fairization of services. But what does it mean? It means we have to pay a lot of attention to technical details, to technical setups. For example, we need to have clear specification of frameworks. We need to have interface protocols digital object interface protocols. We need a system of persistent registries and services like, for example, PIT services. We need to work on semantic interoperability, meaning on concept and vocabulary definitions. We need to work on different access levels. So we have to get away from the idea that access is a click for download. This is very relevant for for the challenges which Martin has with the Public Sector Information Directive. We also need to work on built-in security in our systems, and we have to be aware that machine actionability is core to each of the FAIR principles. So this is why, for our FAIR Office Austria, we have given ourselves the following mission. We connect stakeholders from research communities and service providers. Together, we help to advance the FAIR principles. In order to illustrate a bit um, how we can enable automation processes and machine actionability and really implement FAIR by design, I show you on the next slides some technical solutions. For example, the F in FAIR, the findability the basic basic principle uh, says all the data sets um, have to be assigned with with a persistent identifier so this is an example of actual repositories for example on the left hand side a doi assigned to code the same works with data sets and on the right hand side you can see how both can be integrated or well, here an example how a persistent identifier is part of the metadata and also how metadata can be exported in a machine actionable way. Here an example for, for the I, for the interoperability, meaning that there should be persistent cross references made available. Like here a data set that references to papers or also to code. And when building all these systems, we have to be aware that the system should not stand for itself, but it needs to be connected that the content can be found, found by other systems. So it plays a, a great role to think about external visibility and interlinkage of all these 
systems and tools. Now, I would like to explain a bit how we are organized. So, um, Ronald Meyer explained it in the beginning already. The Fair Office Austria is an initiative that came into emergence within a project, one of the ministry funded projects, which is Fair Data Austria. And owing to this uh, setup, we are in the implementation phase, a consortium of three uh, institutions, which are the TU Wien, the TU Graz, and the University of Vienna. However, we have thought about uh, scalability from the beginning, and we also would like to go beyond the project in terms of duration, and also in terms of stakeholders and partners. Because we think we should also look um, outside of academia. I want, just want to mention museums, for example, which provide a, a great deal of data. Or also, and I refer again to Martin's presentation, to uh, public data sets from public data archives and public data centers. To really bring and anchor the idea and the concept of FAIR into the institutions, we have started to build up a network of local FAIR reference points. This means we want to have inside institutions, clear reference points researchers can ask uh, when it comes to, to questions around FAIR. On the right hand side, you can see the current status. This displays now all the partners from the Fair Data Austria project. However, also here, we would like to expand the network. So if you're interested to become a reference point in your institution, please contact us. We will include you in this network. We will include you also in training um, sessions and we can give you um, visibility on our website. Of course, when talking about science, open science and FAIR, we always have to consider the, the global context, the international context. So first of all, we would like to become an official GoFAIR supporting national office. This means we would support the GoFAIR governance and this means we would also commit to advance the implementation networks here in Austria. The consortium I mentioned before, so the three institutions, TU Wien, TU Graz and University of Vienna, are all members in RDA and in the European Open Science Cloud. We also have formed the Carpentries Austria together, which allows us to enhance our, our strength in trainings and um, in conveying tech knowledge. Uh, two of our Consor two partners in the consortium are part of the Invenio RDM developer community and our partner Theo Graz is particularly devoted to Cybers Austria, which is an analysis tool for data in the life sciences. So please get involved. There are various ways. You can sign up for our newsletter, which will appear quarterly. Um, you can also contact us um, via the website and um, please note down two upcoming events. One will be on 6th of October, which will be another public event. And uh, in the end of October, we will have a webinar on FAIR, uh, which will have more of workshop character and target groups will be researchers and support units. So thanks a lot and uh, stay with us. Thank you, Barbara, for the introduction to the Fair Office Austria. Um, our last speaker for today, Stefanie Lenstedt. Stefanie is a professor of computer science and the head of the Institute for Interactive Systems and Data Science at the Graz University of Technology. Since 2011, she has been the managing director of the No Center. Under her leadership, the No Center has become one of Europe's leading research centers for data-driven business and artificial intelligence. Together with her team, she develops and improves AI technologies in order to ensure the safe and responsible use of data. In her talk today, she will introduce um, 
the tool Cyverse, which helps facilitate fair uh, in um, research workflows. Please go ahead, Stephanie. Thank you for the kind um, uh, presentation. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, you can okay. see them. You, you can uh, switch to the uh, presenter. Ah, no. okay. There we go. Yes, okay, thank you. great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And I also want to say I'm, I'm very, very happy that we uh, uh, now have a fair office uh, in Austria. Um, I think this is a milestone um, going forward in um, these um, initiatives. Um, Okay, we have now heard um, a lot of the things of the um, governmental aspects and, um, uh, and now a lot on the technology behind these things. I would now ask you to join with me and jump into the role of the researcher who now really wants to do something uh, with, with data. And I brought with me some um, use cases, which are all powered by cybers. Um, this, uh, work which we have done has started in 2017 with an HRSM um, project and in that project we um, looked at the whole um, um, data generation uh, analysis until publication um, processes which a researcher typically um, goes through so in the beginning you do some lab work uh, there's the data is generated then you have the data you want to put it somewhere uh, you want to analyze it um, and during these times so what is here in in light red is this data is pretty much still closed most of the time and because you have not really extracted everything out of there, there yet what you want to do and then there comes this break where you say okay now i do a publication at that point in time i really want to throw um give out the data in fair ways uh, to other people um, and then make it um, public. But today I want to focus on this uh, cybers um, part here. So, um, and we, we started out, so basically from inside out, we said we first want to look at data management and analysis, and then later on we go into the two other um, directions. Um, Cyberth is a open source um, project, uh, which is um, actually originally comes from the US University of Arizona. Uh, it's a huge uh, development community behind and also a huge application um, uh, researcher community which are using it. And it started out as a um, planned uh, data repository, um, but now has um, uh, been used in, in all different kind of topics and fields um, uh, already. And so we started out using it um, for the biotech met in this initiative um, in Graz, which combines the free university in Graz, the university Graz, Theo Graz and medical university in Graz. And <clears throat> the idea was how can we bring together all the people who do work on life sciences um, from these three universities and how can we enable them to really work together to do to store their data to share their data and to do analytics um, on top and this is actually what's um, provided uh, through um, this interface um, the interface of cybers is really really simple basically it looks like an explorer so where you just upload uh, your data um, as in, in files, so it's just a simple drag and drop thing. You don't have to, to use anything um, uh, command line specific. It's all um, a normal um, kind of Windows um, interface. And uh, you easily can then you know, right click on one specific data um, uh, file and it provides you with um, all the possibilities for analytics which the system um, offers you. Um, the cool thing about uh, just along the data management is that so we, we did a, quite a lot of um, uh, requirements analysis in the three universities and asked people so what are you really looking forward uh, uh, what, what do you need and most people a lot of institutes said well as soon as a a PhD student leaves, uh, most of the time the data is gone or at least it's not understandable anymore. So this is um, already one point to have a central um, place for an institute or for a whole organizational part 
where you can actually put your data, where it's safe, where you have access rights, you can choose yourself who should access it, who should not access it. Um, it has uh, fair data management, metadata, documentation directly with it. And, um, and you um, can share the data well with collaborators. Um, then, but beyond this just sharing the data, it also provides a whole suite of um, analytics tools. So right now, out of the box, it has more than 3,000 applications which can um, run on the data sets and specifically it knows what kind of apps can run up on which kind of data. Um, so it can provide to you all sorts of um, uh, things starting from um, straightforward statistical analytics all the way to specific life sciences, um, DNA um, uh, analytic uh, tools. Um, and in addition, uh, one of the things which we and also the other universities find very helpful is that it keeps, when you do an analysis, everything which came into the analysis. So you have a log file for your activities and you know which version of which analytics tool was used on which version of your data in order to produce a specific outcome. Um, so even after two months, two years, you still know what you've been doing and uh, can reproduce it. And also you can share this with other people if they want to reproduce your, um, your work. Uh, it has uh, sorts of um, different connections, for example, to the HPC cluster uh, in Vienna and um, all other, uh, a lot of other um, resources. Okay, so now I just want to show you three, uh, four uh, use cases um, which highlight different aspects um, of what um, cybers can do for you. So first is um, merging data. So we have the situation that we had um, Tomislav on the TU card side and Alex on the Medical University card side. They both work together on metagonomics research. Uh, Tomislav is collecting all the meta um, uh, genomics from plants, from the surfaces of plants. And Alex is uh, collecting the meta, meta genomics from the um, surfaces within the room. So for example, the table on which the plant um, stands. And they wanted to bring this data together and work together on it. Uh, since the two universities work with two different providers of DNA analytics um, companies, they also get different data um, uh, structures back when they have their data analyzed. So what um, uh, we did there was to generate a um, common uh, metadata um, and, and, and structural uh, format uh, into which all these um, the data could be linked and then we could do a shared analysis on top. So the nice thing about this is that it's not only um, uh, useful for those two people, but we can offer um, uh, this um, additional uh, format and, and, and processing pipeline to other researchers and there already have been other people who've been asking about it and are using it now. Um, a second uh, use case is really about sharing data. Um, so there's uh, the Theocrats and medical university grads are buying together a, um, um, a, tomo a computer tomograph, uh, which will be um, located at uh, Theocrats. And the universities, uh, the researchers from all universities want to really be able to use it. And so now we develop this um, central uh, um, storage place for all the, the data which is collected from the tomograph and, um, and also for all the, the um, analytics which can be um, done on this. So basically, instead of running around with USB sticks as they did before, now this is all the data uh, in in one um, place, and they call they can all access it um, as they need to. Um, a third use case is about automating analytics pipelines. So we all know that when we have specific data, we need very specific analytics tools in order to 
to work with them. And often enough, it is that we first need to use one tool and then another tool and then the next tool, and we have to kind of um, uh, reformat the data in between in order to move it to the next tool. And um, here, uh, the um, uh, Gustav Oberstdorfer uh, created a pipeline uh, in order to analyze protein structures and um, created such a analytics pipeline based on those different analytics um, apps which were already available within servers. And he basically generated this automatic um, pipeline where uh, from uh, now on he only has to throw his data in, in the front uh, and then gets his result uh, in the back. And again here uh, we have the nice thing that this whole pipeline can be shared and is shared already between um, him and other um, people and other researchers. Um, that has also the nice advantage that sometimes people who are very technically affine, like uh, Gustav, who's very um, um, yeah, more technical person, uh, can develop such things and then also give it to people who might have less um, experiences in those technology. Yeah, and the final. Um, Application case, use case, which we have is that we are using um, uh, uh, cybers already for um, teaching. Um, the idea, uh, here, what has happened is that we, uh, for a bioinformatics course, you want to give certain software environments, the R Studio, um, for to the students, specific data to the students, which they are um, supposed to analyze. So this all could be um, uh, done through cyber. So to, to generate a, a common environment in there in which the students can work. And this also supports our um, uh, cross university study programs. Um, so in this case, uh, uh, the um, chemistry and biology students. But uh, in the future, we we're, have now set up a new study program, program on computational social systems. And there, uh, this system would also be um, used in order to provide an, um, uh, yeah, teaching and analytics environment for those students uh, who will start studying this. Yeah, um, with this, I would like to thank you for also for the whole um, RDM team in uh, the Graz University of Technology, uh, um, Elire, Sarah, Conrad, and many, many others who have made all this um, possible. And maybe one additional um, point, which now came up for what um, Andreas uh, Rauber presented, and also what I think Michael was um, getting at, is the secure environments on how to, to process data. So on the one hand, um, cyber is a very secure environment because you only you, you control who you will give access to the data. In addition, we are working on um, methods which would make it um, possible to analyze data which is encrypted. So there you would even go um, a step further with privacy by saying, okay, we can encrypt the data um, and then we can still do certain kinds of analytics. So um, uh, create aggregations um, uh, and other kinds of, of uh, computations on top without ever um, really uh, giving people full access uh, to the data that they actually can read. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for the great presentation. I would now uh, like to thank uh, all of our speakers again for the fascinating talks. Um, thank you uh, to all our uh, guests again for joining us today and, and the questions in the chat. Um, it's great to see so many faces, even though you don't see all the faces with the cameras off. It's OK. Uh, it's great to see so many people from various backgrounds and various institutions who are interested in FAIR. And uh, the team of the FAIR office and I are excited to work with you, work together um, in the future to contribute to making FAIR a reality in Austria and also internationally. So thank you again so much. And um, please do get in touch with us or anything concerning there. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to Teresa for guiding us through the event today. Happy Keep to in touch. Thank you. Thank you.